Join us on our website, thegrandview.org. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting. A three-day workshop that will change your art forever. homework assignment is about subconsciously trying to create a feeling or something in your painting from nothing. And for a lot of artists this is really difficult. One of the things that I first say is that you want to accumulate a lot of ideas and things. In essence, we were around the holidays, I specifically said that I wanted to have a campfire chat that dealt with you know, the feeling of this time of year. You know, usually when we get towards um, the holidays, the days are shorter, the sun is lower, at least in the northern hemisphere. And we, you want to sense, and I don't know if you guys sense it, but there's just a feeling of like an overcast, kind of cool, kind of gray feeling. Do you guys get that? So in putting together a painting, you kind of have to work actually into your subconscious. Now, I give you the rules of a central focal point, how to create good lighting effects, uh, good composition, all this stuff. All that stuff that all are playing on intuition about your placement of things and then using your lighting effect to help create the central focal point. But when you're creating something from nothing, you kind of have to work in a place where you don't have those objects. And those objects could end up being anything from a church to, a, to an apple, but if we're going to be doing outdoor objects, we're thinking about your, your block, your street, your street lamps. Your, your churches, your community centers, your buildings, your barns, all of that stuff that uh, are outdoors things. And then try to incorporate a feeling of that time of year. Now, purposely I asked you to do this painting in this time of year. So we're getting, we just gone through Christmas, so this was over Christmas period. I want you to kind of be aware. For some people, they're so busy shopping and doing things, they're totally unaware of everything around them. But this, this exercise was for you to kind of look up and take a look to see what does it feel like to be in, you know, alive right now, walking the earth with all of this beautiful atmosphere that's happening right now. You know, if you're going to go out and, and create something subconsciously, the first thing you have to get is that that white canvas that you're looking at is foreboding. What do I do with that? And what I found best when you're trying to paint something in your subconscious is that you have to release your subconscious. So when you're thinking about what you want to paint, you're actually activating the part of your brain that thinks. So let's call that the left side of the brain. And you have your left side of the brain, which is your thinking side, and your right side is your subconscious part of your brain that is the, is the thing that speaks to you when you're showering or when you're driving or you know, when you're, you're, when you're brushing your teeth, that's your subconscious brain that's thinking about things. And then your physical brain is when you're trying to balance your, your, your checkbook and stuff. Um, so what you want to do is engage. Now, if you're looking at a canvas in front of you and you're thinking, what am I going to paint? You're engaging the left side of your brain. And you'll find that the left side of your brain is not very helpful when it comes to that. So what we need to do is we need to actually start marking your canvas so that your right brain can start taking place. Now you know that space when you're looking at something like clouds and all of a sudden you start seeing clouds forming into antlers and you see a deer and there were then a horse or a dragon, you know, and, and how things morph and you go, oh, you know, it's better when you're on drugs, but when you're not, you, you actually could start seeing sheep and all kinds of things on the hillside, you guys all experience that. Or if you sit and you look at really cheap artificial marble, and you can start seeing shapes turning into things, you know, the, um, uh, that, that subconscious. You kind of have to do that with your painting. It's like you've got like a million ideas in your subconscious brain, but your left side of the brain doesn't want to allow you to access that. 
So the best thing you could do at that point is kind of pick up a, a color, in this particular case, kind of a grayish tone, and start just toning your canvas with multiple uh, values of like the same color, a little darker and a little lighter, and kind of go into really abstract mode and get the canvas covered with no agenda, no idea. Um, some of you may have some ideas that you kind of pulled out and you're laying around your studio thinking, oh, this would be good for that kind of thing. But I'm saying, like, you're working from nothing at all. You know? And then at that point, you may decide, oh, I want to stick a church in. I want to do a winter church. You know, some of you might want to do like those leaning tree cards where you have the winter church um, and you have the cowboys that are you know, coming in to, for whatever, for whatever reason, or like a, a, an old house like Thomas Kincaid, and you have the lights burning. So what you want to do is you want to actually kind of have that idea in your head, and just start marking and scribbling your canvas with that color. And you'll find that before long, your subconscious will start seeing a form and shape out of all the little scrapings and markings, and you actually can start seeing a tree develop. Maybe a little feeling of a lake or a creek, or a peak of a mountain. And you just start developing that without any worry or any fear. I mean, I said in my campfire chat that pain is just nothing more than colored mud. And your canvas is just a piece of cloth. So if you just get that, there's no value in any of that. And I get into arguments where people say, but paints are expensive. And it's like, no, they're not. Paints are not expensive. You can buy really cheap paint and do really fabulous paintings, and most of the really big artists buy really cheap paints. Canvases, eh, you know, compared to what you pay for other things, I mean, I'm surprised every time I go to McDonald's, it's $20, $22, you know, for two people. <laughs> and it's like, that buys you a canvas, and the canvas will last forever. Where does that meal end up the next day? <laughs> and so, you know, in comparison to what you can do, if you want to know what's expensive, go play golf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or have other, some other hobbies that are really, really expensive. Like horses. Horses, horses are yeah. really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. I know that intimately. Um, so, so, painting is really a cheap hobby. And, and if you get over that, you know, we're fearful of waste and we're fearful of, of you know, destroying something, you have to get over that and just, just enjoy the process. And if you're actually focusing on the end product, Shame on you. Mm -hmm. Because part of the fun of painting is the process of painting. It's a creation. It's a creation of painting. Yeah. Look at you you are totally about the creation of painting. No emphasis on the end product and look at how fast you paint. I mean you did finish another painting today. Every day she finishes a painting because she just enjoys the process so much. Putting paint off. She's fascinated with it. I remember yeah. when you gave us an assignment to wipe it on and wipe it off. Wipe it on and wipe it off. And then see what was there. Mm -hmm. That was really fun because then you, your subconscious started to see things emerge and then we went from there to create You'd be surprised what you can actually pull up out of your head. If you really get over the fact that what you're doing has to have any kind of value and the outcome has no meaning to it, you can enjoy the process, which is a lot more fun. And when you think about when we practice piano or any other instrument, we don't really have anything to show. When we're done with practicing, we just close the lid. You know, there's no recording of it. But somehow when somebody paints for four hours, they feel like, I've got to have something to show for it. Sometimes people come to class and they go, I didn't get anything done on my painting. I said, yeah, but you've learned so much more. You know, that's really what's really important. It's what, You'll have plenty of time to practice and do all this stuff later. But right now, just enjoy the process of painting. Just enjoy doing this. Because it's amazing. It's amazing that we can do what we do. It is. Yeah. So, this time of year, you stick that feeling in your head. Get into your subconscious. Start marking the canvas. Start seeing subconsciously what comes up. A church. Some trees. A river. A lake. Some rocks. A cowboy, maybe, maybe an elk, maybe some Christmas stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the rule in painting is that you really shouldn't start painting until you actually see what's there. Exactly. When I actually like ask people, so where's your central focal point? And they look at me like, I don't know. I'm like, you're so big. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need to know those things, those questions you have to ask yourself. Where's your central focal point and your eye magnets and all the things that we discussed 
weekly on those things. And you have to have a prevision of what would that, what's that going to look like. And when you actually get that, then you can actually start working towards something. But if you have no idea, you can try this until something hits. But as soon as something hits, you just kind of have to play with your head. Oh, I see a shape of a tree. You've got to start kind of playing with it and see how it fits in your overall composition. Because one thing will lead to another and lead to another. And like I said, if you're in that rim area right before you go to sleep or when you wake up, you're kind of in your subconscious mind. And that's when you get a lot of really great ideas. Look at you. You get really great ideas in the middle of the night going to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Opens the door. There's a mirror. Oh, I'm going to paint that. <laughs> so anyway. So do you suggest that people not use a photo or anything and just sit and see what comes out of their head? I mean, do you do I, that? Do you yeah. actually just do that and just start painting? Mm -hmm. yeah, With I nothing, do. nothing at all, just a blank slate mm -hmm. and you just start painting? Mm -hmm. Sometimes just, I might have an idea, like, you know, like when I do the, my, like the Pine Martin. You know, yeah. head around this way. I kind of start off with a head and an idea. Um, because you see, if you start off with nothing, you can pay attention to eye magnets and checkering and all this stuff. So I kind of start off with a feeling of a, a figure eight or a diagonal, you know, splash. And then, and then I'll kind of start off with the, the suggestion of where I want the head and the body to, to be. But that was, a fan, that was fantastic to just come out of your head. That mm -hmm. was fantastic. And then, but see, that's the only way that, you know, and to put their fish in, the fish at its foot. You know, you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to work out of your head. Because if you go and get a picture and start off with a picture, it starts becoming kind of formulaic. You can't really play with it. So once I get kind of the form in there, then I think about, okay, so now I want the, the, the pine martin's got to be sitting on a branch. And so that kind of gets drawn in. And then I've got this swirl going this way, so I'm going to put something else, maybe a couple of other fallen trees, you know, going what? Across a creek. You know, so I'll put a creek in between them. Since he's standing on the fish, the fish has to be somewhere. But that's all just kind of subliminal ideas that I get as I'm, I'm stretching myself. I mean, at no point do I say, this is exactly what it is. Now, there are artists that do that really good. There are artists that get a photograph and they work from the top left hand side of their painting and they go inch by inch by inch by inch all the way through. And they do a fabulous job and you know, I, it blows me away. Well, they're copying the, <laughs> like a photograph and yet it's, it's, it still comes out really great but it's, it's almost like a recreation of a photograph and if we want to put art photography in our conversation, then it's like just a copy of another piece of art. But I like I like by by Percy. So when you started your Pine Martin, did you have in mind you were gonna make a Pine Martin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was living off of a childhood memory that I had. Oh. Well, not a childhood, but a young man's memory when I was hiking in the Sierras and I came across a Pine Martin. Oh. Okay. And so he was dancing in the waters and playing with a fish, and I have that on one of my fireside chats or whatever. So, so I recreated that, that story in my head, you know, before I started, and I got an idea of how big they are, so, so, you know, because I remember that they were not little things, they were, it was a nice, thing. in fact, it was so, they're so rare, that it surprised me when I came across him, and so I was like, whoa, what's that? You know, I had no idea what it was, but it was like a gigantic brown weasel. <laughs> You know, and so, so in fact, I think they are in the weasel family. And so, so, and he was taunting a fish, you know, like a cat would, you know, so having a great time. So I just kind of played on that memory, and I was thinking of that memory, drawing over a, a figure eight. And when you're in that mode, you're making lots of marks. Remember how I told you to search your painting? Right. Right. Lots of marks, and you get the feeling of the scale, and get it all kind of abstract mm -hmm. down, and start building something on there, an armature to, to work with. And that's what you're doing, is you're building an armature, and when you're doing sculpture, you build a wire form. And basically, when you start with painting, that's exactly what you're doing, too, is you're building a wire form. But, for example, uh, <coughs> I like to see a picture or something like that, and then I start painting, and then I see the idea, I just ended up doing something like that, but totally different. I, I do many things around, mm -hmm. or yeah, change, change things, things. Yeah. But change everything. It's a copy? No, 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 because you're inspired by another Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I took just yeah. that, but I created it. This is kind of vice versa. Because once I get that armature up 
and kind of the form and the shapes that I want to get. Then what I do is I try to find material out there, because I don't have a photo of a pine marten. I didn't have my camera ready when I came across one, and by the time, oftentimes you did. So I go through and I find materials of, that are out there on the internet. Google's great. Back in the olden days, the most valuable thing for an artist was their library. And so they had thousands of books on things so that and they could sketches. go research on sketches too. Mm -hmm. And so, so they would go into their sketches and if they had a sketch of a pine marten, they would use the proportions from that. Um, consequently, I would find pictures of pine martens, maybe a pine marten facing this way since I needed a head this way and a body this way. You kind of assemble something of that, that stuff that's out there, other drawings and other paintings. You kind of play, do the placement. I mean, I remember when I was um, needing a head of a fish, I went down to the fish market over here, and through the counter I took fish, head photos of the fishes of the heads. That, that's the way you kind of assemble it, but it's all about an idea. If we're doing a subliminal idea about this time of year, you want to keep that in mind, and then you start playing with shapes and forms to try to create that. So well, most this. artists are very visual by nature anyhow. Well, they are. And when not, they just smoke a little extra weed and then it comes. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah, but, <yeah. laughs> Not that hard to say. Don't, um, but don't you think we all, I mean, you've been painting for a lot of years, but we all kind of do need those little hints, those little photos. Those little or should sure you do. Because even though we're not going to copy it, it, it gives us, like you yeah, said, the right cool. proportions, maybe the, yeah. the shadow, we see something and, and you know, we, because most of us can't just... That was, makes something out of our brain. That was my hardest part. Was like, okay, where would the shadow be if I put this here, and how is mm. this going to reflect if this is here? Mm. Well, mm. but see, this is difficult for like a beginner student who hasn't really had a lot of painting experience. You know, you guys have had quite a bit of experience, but you still don't have still as much as experience <laughs> as you should have. But no, you don't want to start off that way because then you just kind of get... And this is where abstract art has a lot of value because, you know, you are building up an abstract form and shape, but then trying to bring reason to that, um, you know, and that's where abstract art is, is kind of difficult to, to phrase here because um, abstract art, it, you know, no matter how abstract you go, the human brain wants to resolve things. And so you have people who look at abstract art and they go, I don't get it. But it's because their brain wants to resolve it and there's nothing to resolve. Now, some abstract art, artists will actually resolve it to the point that the viewer gets it. And I think that's when abstract art is extremely valuable, is that when you can use art as a means of communication. But when it's self-expression with no communication value whatsoever, if it doesn't reach the viewer in, in a subconscious way that they could actually benefit or, or see something out of it, then it has no value, it's just wallpaper. Um, so, but uh, you start off with abstract form and shape, and almost every great painting starts off as an abstract. Um, you know, it's form and shape. Yes? Well, that's what I was trying to do with that little tiny piece that I did, and I didn't know there was a mountain in it until, you know, I mean, I, it, was, it was pretty strictly just from memory, but my memory was so wrong about the trees, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I was remembering standing on the bridge, and I was remembering the river, and the feel, and the background mountain. But the trees, you know, you corrected what was going on because it, it made no sense. It looked like I was, you know, looking down the meadow. Yeah, but you're still working subconsciously. Yeah, I was. You know, you still I was. <laughs> but see, that's, that's where if you don't have a lot of experience is that you have to get, like even today, you were doing a building, and I was saying, where's your horizon line? I mean, you kind of, yeah. well, the horizon line's here, then you have that to get that everything is higher, higher or lower in, into that. So you have to kind of figure all that out. So yeah. it's important to know all this stuff. Yeah. This is why... Um, the subliminal painting is so awesome because if you took a photograph of this outdoors with the moon in there, on your photograph, your moon would be like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, why does that happen? Because when you're looking at it, you're focusing on that moon. It brings and it, it up, and yeah. It's like it fills up to you. Yeah. But it feels big. Yeah, it's like the relationship of things are out, out of whack. Yeah. Just like well, I've kind of seen on hikes, I'd see Mount Shasta, mm -hmm. you know, and it just looks so big and so and gorgeous. Yeah. And I take a photograph of it, nothing hard to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That happens to me. It's true. I knew it wasn't that big in reality, it's but I was like, yeah, but you know, the, thing, the same thing happens as if I tell you to just look up here. 
at all this up here, you can kind of look at it. But then if I tell you, look at my eyeball. All of a sudden, it's like the, yeah, the whole... Yeah, one. And you see this in movies sometimes where the, the figure stands still and everything around them starts to move okay. forward. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's how our brain works in, in our eyes. And that's why, you know, painting is not necessarily a painting of a photograph, because when you do that, it loses what the brain wants to do with it. Uh -huh. So when I tell you to focus in on something, your brain goes like this, and actually you're getting a, a, the same thing you have with the camera, a zoom. zoom. And you zoom right into that. Uh -huh. And like it, it, uh -huh. it takes away everything else. And, and so consequently, when you do a moonscape from a photograph, you have the little tiny little, 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 little <laughs> there, you know? Um, but when you blow it up like that, you're painting it the way it feels. Mind. And that's kind of, human experience, and that's why And that's the advantage of a painter over a photographer. Yeah, that's your opinion, you know. That's, that's, in fact, if you think of the moon like, like um, Molly just said, oh, the moon is just really big when it's coming up. But in reference to what we're looking at, it's not. It's actually kind of small, but we focus in on it and we give really a lot of importance and focus into it. If you took a picture of it, it would actually be really quite a, quite a ways away, but it's our relationship to the object that immediately changes. And the way that the brain works is that in order to remember things, it even enhances it even more. So you see this blue color that she's got in here? It's because she's seen a little bit of that when she goes outdoors and, and sees the moon. But then when she's actually painting it, she's like, oh, it's so blue. And that's kind of what the brain does too, is that it enhances things. And if you've ever gone back to the original school that you went to or your original home, it's a lot smaller than you remembered it. <laughs> Okay, so the, so the brain wants to make things bigger and more colorful. That's how, you know, so when you're working from your subconscious, you really get a more powerful, bigger idea. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, 